Hello. Um, the observant amongst you might have noticed that there's a possible typo on my slides, in that your schedule says that this is building websites with Zend Expressive 2, and I seem to have put 3 on the slide. Who wants to talk about yesterday's technology when we could talk about tomorrow's? Zend Expressive 3 is now in alpha. So it is not yet stable, but it is coming. It will be stable before March the 15th, which I think is really specific for the project lead to have said. Instead of said it will go live on this date, or in about some time, it will definitely be before March the 15th. I assume Matthew is going on vacation on that day, and that's why he really wants it done before then. So we're going to be talking about Zend Expressive 3, which is remarkably similar to Zend Expressive 2, but there are some changes, so we'll cover what is going to be relevant in about a month and a half's time, something like that. My name is Rob Allen. I've been doing Zen Framework stuff since the very first version. Zen Framework 0 0.1 was released in 2006, and my first commit to Zen Framework 0 0.1 happened a day later. I got commit access about a month after that, and I've been a contributor ever since. I'm fairly polyglot, I'm self-employed, I freelance, so I will work with whichever framework my clients use. So I've got quite a lot of experience in frameworks, and I still quite like this one. So that's the one we're going to be talking about today. So you've probably already heard of Zen Framework. Zen Framework 1, Zen Framework 2, Zen Framework 3, they're all monolithic frameworks. And then we've got Zend Expressive, and the best description I've got for Zend Expressive is a micro-framework with full-stack components. So what we have here is a very small framework, but we have a wider ecosystem around it to support it and provide more functionality. So in terms of the um, micro-framework core, we've got what you'd expect in a micro-framework. So if you've used Silex, if you've used Slim, if you've used Lumen, they've all got the same set of core components. You've got some sort of router You've got some sort of dependency injection container, some sort of mechanism for rendering templates, you know, the HTML half of your website. Some sort of error handling is required, and you're going to have to deal with configuration. So there will be some configuration as well in any micro framework. And micro, uh, sorry, so Expressive is no different. This is its core. And then because we're part of the Zend ecosystem, we have a whole plethora of other components that will slot straight into your expressive application. Things that you're going to need to flesh out your website or flesh out your API. I'm personally an API person, so things like the API rendering components are always in my apps. Filtering and validation is required for just about every app out there. Database abstraction, session handling, etc. You're going to need them in your application. There are Zend components that you can use that will slot straight in. However, because it is a micro framework, you don't have to. You can use whichever components you like, and they will just work because we're composer based. Expressive is agnostic. The router can be the fast route, or a dot router, or Zend router. We don't force you to pick a router. Obviously, the Zen framework has its own router that came through from ZF2, so that's available. Um, DI container, the same thing. It turns out that people have strong opinions about which dependency injection container they use. So Expressive will support all of these different containers. So the one you are most comfortable with is the one you should use. And similarly with your template layouts. People like using Twig if they want automatic escape in. Other people prefer a PHP-based templating system, so Zen View or Plates will make more sense to them. You can pick the one that makes your project work best for you. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this is a Zen framework project, Zen Expressive. So clearly, the defaults are going to be Zen Router, Zen Service Manager, and Zen View. And they're not. The defaults are Fast Root, Zen Service Manager, and no template whatsoever. Because a good proportion of applications nowadays are APIs, and you do not need a template layer for that. So we're not even going to provide a default to pick the one you want. 
FastRoute is a really good router, so that is our preferred one nowadays. If you're more comfortable with the way Zend Router works, then you can use it. But in Expressive, we choose FastRoute by default. For DI containers, lots of choice. I personally think Zend Service Manager is a really good DI container, so I'm quite happy that it is a default. But Aura DI and Alvin in particular are also really good. If you're used to them or you want auto wiring, then Alrin or Symfony DI container might be better choices for you. Expressive is middleware based. So how we handle our dispatch pipeline is different to if you've used Zen Framework 1 or Zen Framework 2 or Symfony. What they, they've got a more event based pipeline. Expressive is middleware based. It's a remarkably simple system. It's quite easy to get your head around. We have a request from the browser, and then we pass it through individual components, very small components that can manipulate the request or act on the request before sending it down the pipeline to the next component. We provide some middleware by default. So a routing middleware is a component that inspects the URL and works out which action we need to execute later. And then we have a dispatch uh, middleware, which will actually do the dispatching of your action itself, so that you can slot additional middleware components between the two. So it's quite a pipeline, just one, one thing after another, and you must return a response. Has anyone heard of the FIG? the Framework Interoperability Group. They've been around a while. The FIG is a group of people, a group of projects, that agree common standards amongst themselves in order to make interoperability between components easier. It's been going for a long while now, and the very first standard they created was called PSR Zero, which you've probably all heard of. It allows for auto-loading to be standardized, which means that we can use any component in our project without having to do all the hassle around registering magic autoloaders and things like that. PSR zero is the reason that Geordie and Nils were able to write Composer. Are we all using Composer? Yes, we are, pretty much. Few people not. Composer is wonderful, and it only works because of PSR zero and PSR four, so that we can autoload our components. And the FIG group, flush with the success of getting a auto-loading system, have gone on and created a whole load of additional standards. And the ones we're interested in today are PSR 7 and PSR 15. PSR 7 is related to request responses, PSR 15 is related to middleware, and was approved a fortnight ago. So it's now a standard. Expressive, it's middleware pipeline, is PSR 15 compatible? So it will be the first micro framework that supports this standard. There will be others coming. I'm the lead developer of Slim Framework. We will become uh, PSR 15 with Slim 4 probably towards the middle of this year. Like all the PSRs, except for the coding standard ones, it's essentially a set of interfaces. And the one we care about is a middleware interface. So PSR HTTP server is our namespace. And it is just this middle, middleware, sorry, this interface. One function, process. So you have to implement process to implement a component in the pipeline. This function takes two parameters, a request, which is a PSR7 request object, and a handler, which is a pointer object to the next elements in the pipeline. And as I said, you must return a response. As you can tell from this interface, we've used type hinting and we've used return type hinting. It's a PHP 7 or above interface. If you're on 5.6, you need to be upgrading. Fortunately, Wim has just told you how to. So middleware looks a bit like this. This is a really simple timer middleware. I implement the middleware interface and I do something before anything else. So the first thing I do is some work. In this particular case, I'm just storing the current time. 
Then I call handle on the handle object. So that sends me down the middleware pipeline. So now I've left, con left control of my middleware and all the other middleware components are now being executed in turn all the way down to my action. My action will return a response, come back through all the middlewares before they get back to here as that response return. So I now have a response object that has come from my action. I then do some more work after the rest of my application is executed. In this case, I simply get the current time it took to execute, and I write it to the body. So I can modify the response object on the way out of the middleware chain. And finally, I have to return my response. Obviously, you would never write code like this in the real world because you might not have HTML going out of the response, so you would probably check that it's HTML before you go and write an HTML comment. So that's what PSR Midware looks like. How do we get started with Expressive? We use Composer. Everyone uses Composer. We've already agreed that. Composer, create project, Zen framework, etc. And then what Zend Expressive does is it leverages a feature of Composer to act as an installer. Composer is a really, really good project. They're really clever people over there, so we've leveraged their work. And what we do is when you do your create project, we hook into the Composer system to ask you what type of Expressive project you want. And there's a whole set of questions that come up that you can't read. They look something like this. So nice blue background or cyan background. What type of installation would you like? And then you can say, well, I want a minimal one, I want a flat one, I want a modular one. However you are laying out your particular expressive application, there's multiple choices. And then we ask you which router you want, which DI container you want, whether you want templates, etc. We just ask all the questions, and then we build up a project that matches what you're trying to do. And then we prove that we are not designers. What did we do before Bootstrap? Um, you get a really, really simple demo HTML page just to prove to yourselves that you've actually installed a project. Obviously, the first thing you do is wipe all this out because nobody wants a website that looks like this nowadays. But you're now running your expressive website and you're confident that the pipeline is working. This is a standard directory structure if you pick the flat format. If you choose the minimal, you'll get a lot fewer directories. But we've got a number of stuff going on here. You can see a bin directory. The bin directory is where any scripts go that you need to run for within your project. Config holds configuration. Config autoload holds application instance configuration such as your database credentials and things like that would go into the autoload folder. They get loaded automatically for you. The ones in the root config directory, like pipeline and roots, are how you configure the way your application is structured. Public folder, fairly obvious. That's going to be the folder that the web server will serve from. So you can see an index.php in there. That is your entry point. Source, that's clearly where your source code goes. Test is clearly where your tests go, because you are obviously all writing tests. That source slash app directory acts as a module, so you can live in your own namespace particular code. So we can create multiple namespaces within source in order to separate out our code, maybe reuse it between projects, or just for organizational purposes. Or your code goes in here. There's one class that lives in your app folder, which is called config provider, which enables configuration of the code within this code base. So that's where you will add the I registrations for this particular module. It looks something like that. So we've got a source folder and a test folder again. And then we've got handlers is the word we use for actions nowadays, because it's modern, I assume. Um, so there's our home page handler. That is an action. Ping handler, that is another action. Templates, that's where our HTML code goes. This time, I've chosen Twig. So that's why I've got a Twig extension. Handlers look like this. 
The other half of PSR 15 is the request handler interface. And the request handler interface has a method called handle in it, which takes a request, and you must return a response. So this is your action. Your action is at the end of the pipeline chain, so you have to return the response containing the HTML that you want to send out to the browser. So part of the request objects with, uh, sorry, part of the PSR7 implementation within Expressive, there's an HTML response object. So you can guess what that one does. It sets content type to HTML, sets a 200 status code, and you put your HTML in as the first parameter of the constructor. We now have the world's most simplest Hello World application. No, probably not the world's most simplest. Within Expressive. So let's write a web page. So you just come up with a demo. And my normal demos are things like CRUD applications. I normally use bookshelves or in the old days I used to use CDs, but nobody knows what a CD is anymore, so that one went. What's current today? You know what's current today? Bitcoin is current today. So this is a Bitcoin conversion program, which will tell you how much one Bitcoin is worth in pounds, dollars, or euros. And I chose this one because there's a free to access API that gives me the data, which is why it's nice and simple to implement. Um, downside, of course, is I have to keep changing the screenshots <laughs> because the value changes so frequently. <laughs> so we need a route. We're going to put our new page on a URL. Our page URL is going to be slash Bitcoin. To do this, we put some code into the config slash roots.php file. Firstly, we have to specify the method. This is going to be a GET request. It's good practice nowadays to be aware of which methods are accepted by your action. So this particular action only accepts GET requests. We have a method for all the HTTP methods, GET, POST, PUT, PATCH, DELETE. If you wish to have one action respond to multiple methods, you can use either any or you can use root, and then you pass in a list of the methods you support. It's very difficult to justify those two. You probably should not be using them. Roots have a pattern. This is the URLs that the router will look at in order to work out if this action needs to be executed or not. So the pattern can be a literal string. We're going to use fast route here because that's the default, and it also fit on one slide that way. Literal string slash hello. The URL matches slash hello. We're going to run this pat we're going to run this action. Placeholders. We don't want to have to create loads and loads of routes with all the possible human names in the world. So we can have a placeholder called name. I put it in braces, and now I can do app get hello slash rob and this action will run. I can make them optional, put square brackets around it. I can nest my square brackets. So slash news, or slash news slash year, or slash news slash year slash month. I can't do slash news slash month. It doesn't work like that. It's associative left to right. Lastly, I can constrain my placeholders via regular expressions. I know you all love regular expressions because you're developers. We're all really good at them, aren't we? Fortunately, other people are, so we just steal other people's regexes. But this one's nice and simple. Slash D for digits, exactly four of them, please. So here I specified that my year must have exactly four digits, and all things work wonderfully. Roots can have a name. So I can name this root Bitcoin. Why would I name a root? I mostly name a root because SEO experts think they control the URL nowadays. So sooner or later, you've written your application, and someone comes along and says, you know that URL slash Bitcoin, we need to change it to be slash Bitcoin hyphen this, hyphen that, hyphen the other, hyphen something else, in order to make it more visible. So when they do that, you don't want all the links in your website to have to be changed as well, all the places where you refer to it. So we can use a URL helper to generate the URI based off the name. So here I'm generating user.profile. I pass in one of the parameters, requires the name, and it will generate the URL for me. 
So no matter how often the marketing types rename it from profile to something else, it will continue to work. And lastly, roots have a handler, which if you remember, is the same as an action. So roots have an action, a handler. The code that is run only for this particular URL pattern. Handlers receive a PSR 7 request, and they manage your business logic. Because you are really good developers, most of your code does not live in your controller. That's what we used to do, but we have learnt. Most of our code now lives in our model layer, in our service classes, in our domain layer. And we have a very small action which just operates against the PSR 7 response, marshals it, deals with our business logic, and then it must return the PSR 7 response. So say it's been implemented as a PSR 15 request handler. If you need to create one of these, there's a tool for doing so. Composer, because we like Composer. Then the tool's expressive, handler colon create, and it will go and create you your action class for you. And as of yesterday, it will also create the template file for you as well, so that you get a good starting place to create your new actions. This is what it looks like. This is a fairly typical action. They're not very big. You will notice that there is one function in the action. We don't have controllers. It's an action class. So if you come in from Zen Framework 2, for instance, we had a controller class with multiple action methods in it. We now have one action, one class. This makes testing much easier. It makes dependency injection much cleaner. So that is the way we go nowadays. There's our handle method. As before, PSR 15's handle inter handler interface. There's our actual work. All the actual work related to this particular web page is done in some service, the Bitcoin service, BTC service. And it magically gets current prices. You know what's really cool about this? I don't have to show you the code for that, so you can just assume it works. See, it's in the model, someone else's problem. And then we return an HTML response. But to generate the HTML, we use a template. So we have a Twig template, which is referenced by app colon colon Bitcoin hyphen page, which will render out our data and make it visible to our users. That Bitcoin service needs to be injected into our action. You'll notice that we didn't instantiate it within the action itself. We pass it in via the constructor. We do this to make everything much more testable. So dependency injection is baked into Expressive. It is much easier to use it than to not use it. So you may as well use it. So we're going to create a constructor for our action. It's going to take the template interface, the, te sorry, the template renderer interface for rendering our templates, and it's going to take our Bitcoin service. It doesn't do much, it just assigns them to variables. In order to show you how that works, I'd like to segue quickly into expressive configuration. This is a technical term. It's a mushed up array. We start with the config provider classes from our modules, so our app config provider class, and then each PHP file that lives in config autoload is mushed on top. So any file that you put in config autoload can override the configuration created by the modules. So your modules can have default configuration that this particular application can override. That's really powerful and really convenient. And it's all PHP arrays, so it's quite easy to understand. You get a number of common top-level keys, but you can create any keys you like. So dependencies, twig, validators, etc. The sort of um, keys you expect to see. Obviously, dependencies is the key we use for configuring our DI container. And you can use the same configuration for all the different DI containers we support. So this is what a config provider looks like. It is simply an invocable class. So you use a magic method, underscore, underscore, invoke, and then we have to return an associative array. For convenience, we tend to split it out into sub-functions or sub-methods. 
so that this doesn't get too big, makes it easier to reason about, and makes it easier to fit on slides when you're presenting. So guess what get dependencies looks like? It returns a subkey, factories. It also does invocables, and it does aliases, and a whole load of other stuff. Look up the, the DI container documentation if you care. I'm going to return a factory, so I have to tell the DI container how the, what factory I wish to execute for a given, a, a given class, an action class in this case. So I'm mapping my Bitcoin page handler, which is my action class, against my Bitcoin page factory, which is a class that knows how to create the action class. Then my dispatcher, when it decides it needs to render or execute the Bitcoin page handler, will ask a DI container, please give me a fully configured action class, please. And the DI container will run my factory for me. So my factory looks at a lot of this. So factory is a fairly complicated word. It, we use it to make ourselves sound clever. There's an awful lot of terminology in, terminology in the software industry. We have this terminology to make sure that we feel superior to junior developers. There's probably another reason, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So a factory simply means we have to return a new instance of a class. That's all it means. We're creating classes. So again, it is an unscore unscore invoke method. Um, and I return a new Bitcoin page handler. That's my action class. That's all my factory has to do. And I can pass in my dependencies that my constructor for my action needs, and I retrieve them from the container. And the reason I do that is that the container will not construct them unless we need them. So I'm avoiding creating classes that I will not necessarily need for this particular request, which is a little bit more efficient. And that's it. That's, we've got that far. We've now got our action done. We have our service class injected into our action. We're executing our service class, hitting the API, bringing it all the way back. Now we need to display it to the user. We call that templating in Expressive. It's the view layer. You've already seen that. We have a render method, which takes the template name and the data that you wish to pass through to the template to be rendered. They're namespaced with the colon colon. Tends to be the same PHP namespace, but lower cased. And it maps to a directory on disk. So app colon colon maps to the app directory. And then the other half of the template name, Bitcoin hyphen page, maps to the file name on disk. The .html.twig is provided by Expressive because we've chosen the Twig renderer. Had we chosen the ZenView renderer, it would have been bitcoin-page.phtml, because that's what ZenView uses. So it does that automatically for you. I quite like Twig. Anyone here use Twig? Yeah, a few people. It's quite nice. It comes from the Sensio people. They're clever. We like them a lot. They've got a fairly good manual. And that's one of the key things I use for evaluating whether I'm going to use a component or not. Can I understand the manual? So twig.symphony.com will give you the manual. Key things you need to care about, variables are in double braces, control statements are in brace percent, and comments are in brace hash. So this is a typical template. Quite a lot going on there. Key things we care about. You notice there's the brace brace for rendering out a particular piece of data. So I'm rendering out the symbol. So is it dollars or is it euros or is it pounds? And then I'm rendering out the rate, which is a float, so I number format it. So I pass it through what Twig calls a filter in order to make it look quite pretty. Two decimal places is plenty for normal fiat currencies. We have some control statements. There's a for loop. So for price in prices, and that's brace percent. And then we have template inheritance. Template inheritance is how we do layouts in Twig. So any given template that we choose to render can inherit from a parent template, which can inherit from a parent template again. You can have a tree as deep as you like. And the key thing about the um, template inheritance is it provides this cohesive look and feel. So our default CSS, our default JavaScript, the structure around our HTML can all go in one place, so we don't have to copy and paste it around. We get a base skeleton. 
and you pick which particular skeleton you want by that extends line at the top. So in here I'm extending the default layout. So my base skeleton looks something like this. If you go to the actual base skeleton, there's an awful lot more code in it, but the fundamentals, it looks something like that. There's some HTML. I'm not very good at HTML. There's some tags here. Um, key things are blocks. So here I've got a block content, which my original template can override, can provide the content for. So block content there, block head, and then block title can live within block head, so I get to choose whether to override just the title or whether I need to override everything. You get a lot of flexibility with Twig. I quite like it. I think it's worth investigating. And you get this, which proves that I know even less about styled HTML pages than the Zen people do. These prices were correct two days ago. Don't base your investment decisions on them. So one Bitcoin is worth roughly $8,500-ish $8, today. Unless, of course, there's been a massive spike in the last day and a half that I don't know about. Um, great. We now have a working website. You now know how to build an expressive site. So it's not particularly complicated. How cool is that? Fairly good overview. I said that expressive was a, had a wider ecosystem had components from the wider Zend ecosystem. So let's look a little bit about adding some components. We're going to add the ability to enter our own amount in pounds and find out how many bitcoins they are. This time we need lots of decimal places. So 123 pounds and 45 pence is worth 0 0.020011 bitcoin. So there's not many bitcoin for 100 quid. How do we do that? We need a form on our web page. That's dead easy. I don't know a lot about HTML, but even I can write a form in HTML. So this is why I recommend you write a form in your websites. Use HTML, it's quite good at it. So we create a form. A little bit of um, twig with dot brace brace amount there. So we have a label, we have our input filter, we have our button, and then finally we're going to output our results. So number format, six decimal points this time. And now we need to validate the data. You're not going to accept any data from a user in any form whatsoever without validating it. Do not ever trust a user. They are untrustworthy fundamentally. Send input filter is quite a good input and filtering, filtering and validation component, so that's one we'll use. There are other ones out there. Um, I use this one even when I'm writing applications in other frameworks, because I think this one works remarkably well. It's quite a simple system. We have our untrusted data. We pass it through a filtering layer. We pass it through a validation layer. And if it is valid, we can use that data. And if it's not valid, we will reject that data. We're going to install it via Composer, because that's how we install every component in the world. So we're going to do that. And because it's a Zen Framework component, or a Zen component, we are aware that you are installing it into an expressive application. So again, we hook into the magic of Composer, and we thank Geordie and Niels for the extra work they did for us. Well, not for us personally, but we are leveraging it. Where we can ask you, do you want to automatically install the config provider into your expressive application? And you will answer yes, which is the default, because that's what you will want to do. So we will automatically configure the Zend component into your expressive application for you. It will automatically register the dependency injection factories required and any configuration required without you having to think about it. And we create an input filter. Input filters look something like this. They're basically an array. We use a factory. As you can imagine, a factory creates a new instance. So our factory will create an input filter object for us, and we pass in an associative array. The key of each element in the array matches the name of your form elements. Or if you're doing an API, the name of the keys in your JSON payload that you're accepting. Then you have your filters. Filters are destructive. They normalize the data. 
If you're doing telephone numbers, this is where you remove the spaces that the user has added, or the brackets, or the hyphens, or whatever else they're added. Just remove them, because you don't care about them, but the user types them in. So we can remove unneeded um, information from the user. I'm asking for a number, so I'm going to convert it to a number. Two int is a really, really bad choice, mind you. And then I can validate it. Validation is a yes, no question. Does this data meet this criteria? If it doesn't, we throw it away, we reject it. I'm going to say, is the number that we're provided, the amount, greater than zero? We're not doing negative numbers in this application. So this is a process that we looked at before. In terms of the flow diagram, the key things here is we call is valid in point three, and then we have to retrieve the sanitized data using get values. So code-wise, it looks something like this. So back into our action, there's our handle method. We retrieve the data from the user using the standard PSR7 um, methods, get query parameters in this case, because I would like to have a URL that my users can email around. If it's post data, I would use get parsed body. So we know where our data came from. Did it come from the query? Did it come from the post data? Set it into my input filter, and then I can call this valid. Is this data valid or not? If it is, then I'm going to retrieve the data using get values, and then I'm going to send it off to my service to do all the real work. So all the real work is still done in my domain layer. And then I can, if on a failure, sorry, if the data is invalid, it's minus three or something like that, I can retrieve the error messages using get messages. And then I can display them to the user and say, you messed up, try again. That's it. So to summarize what I've told you today, Zend Expressive is a micro framework. It's the future of the Zend Components project. We still have Zend MVC. If you are used to the Zend Framework 2, Zend Framework 3 way of working, that is not going away. It will be supported for a long time ahead. And there's a gentleman called Zerkus who is currently working really hard to modernize our monolithic framework. So that is still in existence. I think Zend Expressive and the micro framework paradigm is way more relevant today. I think you are way more likely to be creating microservices and smaller websites going forward. We're going to see a lot more use of JavaScript on the front end that is using um, XHTML requests, X HTTP requests, sorry, to talk to backend services. And micro framework is a far better way to implement those sort of websites. So Expressive is really good at this. It comes with a router, it comes with DI container. The DI container is really important. You should be using DI nowadays because it simplifies testing. It also encourages you, sorry, encourages you to split out your business logic from your controller actions. And that means that your main code base will and can outlast your framework usage. Depending on the type of app you write, the sort of apps I write, I've changed frameworks but kept all the core logic before now. Separation out is really important. Because Zend Expressive comes from the Zen Framework community, we already have a wide uh, ecosystem. Got a lot of other components that are useful for creating websites and APIs. If you're creating APIs, I highly recommend you look at the problem API component and you look at the how component. They make generating compliant and nice to use APIs so much easier. Particularly the error handling one. One pet peeve of mine is if you're going to write an API, please make sure you supply the error messages in JSON, not in HTML. This isn't difficult stuff. It's a component installer way with Zend Expressive. Composer requires Zen Framework, Zend Expressive problem details, and your API will always return JSON if that's what the client has asked for, or XML, because it's a nice standard. Highly recommend you take advantage of the wider ecosystem with your micro framework. You get to pick 
the components that work best for you. So we see a lot of expressive applications that use Illuminate and Eloquent for their database or use Doctrine for their database. You're not tied to using ZenDB just because it comes from the same project. Use the components that work best for you. That's what Expressive gives you. You want to learn a little bit more about this? The documentation is on docs.zenframework.com, fairly obviously. The actual code base, if you want to actually look at the code, is on GitHub. I write about this stuff, so acrobat.com in the Zend Expressive uh, category. Um, the Zen Framework people will blog, and if they do, it's on framework.zen.com slash blog. And if you actually want a book, you know, I've heard of books, apparently they're still a thing, then Matt Setter has written Zend Expressive Essentials, which is quite good. 